Hello. Um, I'm going to read you, um, and I'm probably going to do it in a couple of different parts. There might even be three different parts because QuickTime doesn't let um, me film videos for very long. So I'm going to read you um, a story. This is a fantastic story called NCYS Pilgrims. Um, it has great illustrations. And in honor of Thanksgiving, um, I like for people to know a little bit about the history of Thanksgiving. Um, now, one of the things that's pretty interesting about Thanksgiving is sometimes we think that the pilgrims were the first people that came from Europe and were wandering around North America. They absolutely were not. They were not the first people to come here. In fact, there were a lot of other people wandering around North America at that same time. Um, people that had come from Europe, um, especially particularly Spain, there were a lot of people that were sent to kind of explore, to look for gold in North America. And they looked in Florida for gold and they looked around New Mexico and in Southern California and in Texas. And so there were a lot of other Europeans that were exploring. Russia was exploring um, and looking for fur in California and Washington and Oregon. So um, by no means were these first pilgrims the first people that came here um, from someplace else. Also, there were thousands thousands and thousands of of Native Americans that were living on North America and South America um, as well. So there were already people living here um, when the pilgrims came and they had been living here for quite some time. All right, so this is the start of N.C. Wyeth's Pilgrims. And N.C. Wyeth was a really famous illustrator, book illustrator. So it has, this has phenomenal paintings. The 16th and 17th centuries were a time of religious struggle in England. The rulers wanted their subjects to follow the established church, but some people held different beliefs. One such group, referred to as separatist, held secret meetings, but they grew afraid when some of their members were put in prison. They left England for Holland, but they could not settle comfortably among the Dutch. As time passed, they heard stories of a settlement in North America called Virginia. This new world promised land, economic opportunity, and most importantly, the hope of religious freedom. So the separatists decided to cross the ocean and establish a colony of their own. They made an agreement with a group of London businessmen the settlers would receive passage and supplies in return. They would send the London company fish, fur, and lumber for seven years. The separatists in Holland bought a ship, the Speedwell. Those in London hired another ship, the Mayflower. Even with two ships, many of the separatists were left behind with the hope of making the crossing later. Both ships set sail from Southampton, England, but twice the leaky Speedwell had to turn back. Each time the Mayflower followed her, and finally on September 6, 1620, the Mayflower alone departed from Plymouth, England on her historic voyage. So that's why you don't ever hear about the Speedwell as part of Thanksgiving, because it didn't make it. <laughs> While no pictures survive, researchers have reconstructed the Mayflower's appearance from documents and paintings of the time. Likely she was a three-masted ship, 90 feet long with a crew of 25 sailors. Of the 102 passengers crowded into the damp quarters, 44, 19 men, 11 women, and 14 children were separatists. The others had been recruited by the London Company, referred to by the separatists as strangers. They did not entirely share the separatists' religious beliefs, but they did share a desire for a new life in a new land. These included Miles Standish, a professional soldier hired as the commander of the separatist militia. There were also some hens, goats, and two dogs. Noise was a constant companion. Timbers creaked, sails and rigging flapped, rats scratched, and bilge water gurgled. 
At night, some 90 people slept in the area known as tween decks, which means between decks, most on straw mattresses on the hard floor. The stuffy space was also cluttered with chests, barrels of provisions, and building equipment. There was not a place on board where there was silence or solitude. The overcrowding taxed everyone, and tensions ran high between the passengers and the sailors. The crew resented the separatists' daily psalm singing and prayers, while the pilgrims disliked the sailors' swearing. The pitch and roll of the rough waves made seasickness a constant problem. For those passengers not too seasick to eat, most meals were simple, salted meat or fish and hard, dry ship's biscuit. There were also dried peas and beans, dried fruits, cheese, and butter. The food was washed down with beer, which even the children drank. One of the reasons why um, people drank beer a lot in the 16 and 1700s was because water wasn't always clean. So um, beer was kind of safer than having water that had gone bad. So a lot of times kids, when I taught fifth grade, we talk a lot about this um, because we talk about the 13 colonies and we would always talk about how kids drank beer and the kids in my class were like, that is awesome. <laughs> but really it was just um, because water wasn't great back then. There was no real option. There was nothing else really to drink on the menu except for beer and ale other than water and milk, right? And sometimes milk wasn't ava available. The food was washed down with beer, which even the children drank. Lice, boredom, homesickness, and fear added to the misery. During the journey, a servant to the group's doctor died of the fever and was buried at sea. A boy was born and named Oceanus. The weather ranged from fair and gentle to raging storms. During one storm, the ship's main beam cracked. Some thought all was lost. If the main beam, the middle beam, cracks on your ship or you're like a cannonball hits it, your ship's done. It can't steer without that middle mast. And so they were all probably thinking, this is it. We're done. We're done for. We're in the middle of the ocean and we have no middle mast. But the ship rode out the storm and the beam was repaired with an iron screw that had been brought for house building. In the course of another storm, a passenger fell overboard but managed to catch hold of a rope that was trailing in the water and was hauled back to safety. So it was a weary group that heard the first cries of land ho and crowded the railing for a look at their new home. For 66 days they had been at sea, but on November 11, 1620, their adventurous journey ended, or so they thought. In fact, many more adventures and dangers lay ahead. Here's the next fantastic and see why if painting showing some geese and snow from the deck of the ship the passengers gazed at a bleak landscape some of the sailors muttered that the place was filled with wild beasts and wild men called indians a few of the passengers talked of returning to england but most were determined to stay and soon began to discuss what to do next because they had landed so far from their intended goal Virginia, the strangers felt that they should not have to honor their agreement with the London merchants. But the separatists argued that they should proceed as they had planned. Ultimately, the strangers agreed, and together the two groups drafted an agreement known as the Mayflower Compact, which set out the principles that would govern their settlement. From this point, the groups became so intermingled that all have become known as pilgrims. So, on the ship, there were these two separate groups of people. They were fighting all the time with each other. And actually the sailors too were a third group. The um, pilgrims and the, and the separatists were fighting, fighting, fighting. And finally, when they realized we have to, they thought they were going to Virginia. They went off course and they went a lot further north to Massachusetts. And they realized in order for us to survive, we have to work together. We can't be two separate groups of people fighting with each other all the time or we're all going to die. The first exploring party left the ship on November 11th. 
They replenished their dwindling supplies of wood and water and marveled at the abundance to be found in their new homeland. On Monday, November 13th, a landing was made to repair the shallop, a small boat used for exploring. While the men repaired, the women washed clothes. Since there had been little chance to do more than rinse in salt water on the Mayflower, the washing took all day. Spread out to air, that first wash day was a rainbow of clothes, red skirts, blue pants, purple capes, and green stockings. Soon after, a second scouting party went out. On this trip, they found the remains of a hut with curious mounds nearby. Digging into the mounds, the explorers found baskets filled with corn. They named this place Corn Hill and brought 40 bushels of corn back to the ship, promising themselves to make payment later, which they eventually did. To the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower, to the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower, the strange multicolored corn must have seemed a fortunate sign indeed. With enough seed corn to plant in the spring, they now felt more hopeful about their prospects. They took somebody else's corn though, right? That's somebody's corn supply that probably the late the local tribe put the corn aside and buried it so that they could use it for planting, right? So it said that they paid them back. Let's hope they did. But winter winds and icy rain soon drove all but the hardiest sailors below deck. Men returning from runs to shore reported the ground was covered with snow. The need to find a place for their colony grew more urgent than ever. For many, the situation must have seemed little better than when they were on the high seas. They wondered if they were ever going to find the right spot to build their new home. Many more scouting parties went out, including one that ventured out in the shallop in mid-December. One night during this trip, while camped on shore, they heard a strange cry. Frightened and confused, the men fired their muskets in all directions, and the noise stopped. They assured themselves that they had heard only the cry of wolves, but sleep did not come easily. Early the next morning, they heard the cry again. The pilgrims retreated, firing two shots. The Indians, still at a distance, continued their cries. They shot a few arrows at the pilgrims and then fled. Though the barricade bristled with arrows, miraculously, no one, Indian or pilgrim, had been wounded. The pilgrims gathered the arrows, which were eventually sent back to England as curiosities, and continued their explorations. They named the site First Encounter. On Friday, December 9th, the pilgrims discovered a small cove. The following Monday, they sounded the waters and found them deep enough to harbor large ships. Then they moored the shallop and explored inland, where they found some abandoned cornfields, forests that would provide timber, and a number of freshwater streams. Here was the site they had been seeking. So here's this great N.C. Wyeth painting. The pilgrims spent much of their first winter living aboard the Mayflower. They had only two small boats, and winter weather slowed the unloading process even more. As some unloaded the ship, others began to work on a few small cabins, as well as a common house, where most would live and where goods could be stored. A fire that destroyed the thatched roof of the common house slowed the work even further. In that desolate place, not a scrap could afford to be lost so everyone worked frantically to salvage the stored goods. While most of what was stored inside was saved, repairs could not be made because illness had begun to take a terrible toll. Next page, we see some geese flying. And this probably, this kind of looks like Miles Standish was the person who was the military figure of the pilgrims. He kind of looks like a military figure. Deadliest of all was pneumonia, though at the time the pilgrims believed that it was scurvy. Caused by poor shelter and by the constant waiting in winter's cold waters to get from shallop to shore, by April half the pilgrims had died. Half the pilgrims had died. Sometimes as many as two or three in a single day. A handful of people, including Captain Miles Standish, remained healthy but in spite of their tireless efforts, the deaths continued. Because of their dwindling numbers, the pilgrims began to fear attacks by the Indians. 
But the Indians remained at a distance. The Indians were like, we're staying away from those sick people. <laughs> right? Those sick people are dying. The Indians were watching them. You know, I mean, they were, they were, they had their eyes peeled and they were watching them and they were thinking, these pilgrims don't have a clue. They're not going to know how to survive. Right. And now all of them are sick. So let's stay away from them. Right. Once they took some unguarded tools, but they would run off if approached by a pilgrim. Toward the middle of March, however, an Indian warrior strode boldly into Plymouth. He spoke a curious English that was hard for the pilgrims to understand, but they learned his name was Samoset. He was an Abnaki Sagamore, or chief, from what is now Maine, and he came on behalf of a tribe called the Pocanket, now called the Wampanoag. He spoke of another Indian named Squanto, who had actually been to England. We're going to stop right there, and I'm going to record part two so that it doesn't freeze in the middle. All right, so we will come back to part two and we'll get to know a little bit about Samoset and Squanto. Squanto, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that of all of many of the people in history, in United States history, Squanto may have had one of the most interesting lives ever. In his lifetime, he was kept as a slave. He was kidnapped. He lived in London, a big, huge city. He had everyone in his tribe die, including his whole family. Um, so he has just had a lot of really interesting, positive and negative kind of adventures in his life. I don't think there's anyone that has a more interesting life than Squanto. And if you ever get a chance to read about him, you Google him and look him up and see all of the crazy things that happened in his life. All right. So once they mention Squanto, I get all excited because he's pretty interesting. So we're going to stop right here and we will pick up at part two.